Hello, everybody. Hey. I am Tony Garcia. And I'm Mike Stout. And this is Useless Podcasts. Uh, the Useless Podcast. The Useless Podcast. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about three topics that we've come up with. Yes. Uh, and trying to fill up an episode. Um, uh, first, why don't we catch up, Tony? It's been such a long time. It's been a while. Since I've seen it's you. It's been a little while. It's been uh, minutes. That's since? right. Yeah. yeah, or seconds. You've aged. How you're how, not the same man I knew. How has that has that been going for you? I uh, you know what it's been okay. It's been okay. Hard times. All right. Well, now that we've got that out of the way, because from listening to other podcasts, I understand that's what you have to do at the beginning of a podcast. Oh, okay. Uh, first thing we have on our we'll list. we'll get better our, our opening banter then. Yeah, maybe I we'll, didn't realize the opening banter was so important. Apparently, it's key. Okay. Uh, based on my limited research on the topic. All right. We'll get something going. All right. Well, also having an agenda is key, and this time we do have an agenda. As we know each other better, the banter is going to get better. That's true because we we haven't been doing. I mean, this we've only been doing. We've only been going about twenty years. Twenty years now. Have yeah. we been friends for twenty years? Almost getting there. Oh Jesus Christ! We're gonna have to end this. <laughs> All right. So so the first thing on our list, Tony, is small things. Do you remember what that was about? Uh, that was about the the little things that you think. Wouldn't make that big a difference, but actually become a huge turning point in the development of a, of a given feature. Right. So this is some tiny, tiny feature that you would never expect would be important at all. Especially if you were playing the game, it would vanish amidst the noise of the game. Right. That and ties yet, it all together. And yet. It's the glue. It's the glue that ties it all together. For example, I tweeted the other day about my um, uh, damage numbers. It's not going to be the other day necessarily game. when this goes up. Uh, yeah, that's true. Okay, Let, let's re, let's redo that. Okay. I tweeted a while back about uh, my damage numbers. Yes, uh, the scrolling damage numbers and how much more fun the game got once I implemented them. And it's weird that something as small as damage numbers would have such a big impact. And uh, I'm, I, and it's getting to the point now where I sort of know which things are small and would have a lot of impact. But when I tell people, they don't believe me. Right. So, like, uh, uh, I'll say, you know, I'll have these moments where I have to go to a programmer and I'll, I'll be like, look, I realize that you have this gigantic list of bugs and that this little feature, like damage numbers, does not sound like it's very important. In terms of impact on fun, this is the most important thing you can be doing right now. I've had to have those conversations with people and they just look at me like I'm crazy. And then after it's done, everybody's happy. I have a particular story, and this isn't even that small, but it, it, it definitely factors into the kind of thing that you wouldn't be significant. Okay. Because it doesn't have a gameplay uh, effect, but it does so much. Uh, back when we were working on one game, I had enemies that were sort of jumping through windows. Okay. And when I was first prototyping it, they would be in their spot, they would jump out the window, and then I would just kill the window uh-huh. just to you know make it all work. And people would play it, and I'm like, oh, that's okay. No it's shattering just, glass? No shattering glass. Okay. So they would play it, and I'm like, oh, that's okay. No, no sound effect? No sound effect. Okay. And uh, they would just see it, and they would think, okay. And then they walk away, and yeah. then we'd be done with it. There's nothing. There's nothing there. Yeah. Because what would, let, let me describe, I think I understand this, but let uh-huh. me describe it for the, the listeners. What you had was, say, an empty featureless hallway, and a window on one side, with a dude standing right on the other side of the other window, and then he would jump through the window, and the minute he touched the window, it would disappear. Right. And there would be no sound of crashing glass. There'd be no glass. He would just jump through where the window used to be and land on the floor. Yep. Okay. And then people would play through it. They'd say, looks good. Keep going. Walk away. Yeah. That was it. No, nothing, nothing mean about it. Nothing great about it. Just keep going. Keep doing it. You're good. Uh, next day... Put some time in. Put some particle effects on there. So some glass shattering. Glass shattering. Uh, put a nice little stinger on the glass coming out. Uh, a little musical stinger? Or... Little, just a little sound effect of the shattering like, glass. Shh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nothing else changed. Just same that window. Same exact gameplay. Exact same gameplay. Showed it to somebody. This is amazing. This is so much fun. Even though that has no impact on player experience. The gameplay did not change at all. Yes. But now it's fun. Yeah. It just is. And uh, I can't and, explain it. And that audio, it's so much of the reason why it's fun. Right, like, exactly. Even if you didn't have the particles and you put in the audio, already that's 
twice as fun as right. it was before. You know, like it just it's weird how you don't even most of the time notice it. And then that's the right. whole thing. Now, someone could come along and say, okay, well, what, how does that translate into uh, the small hidden things that nobody would know? Well, I think people don't understand how much, the, how much fun is actually the confluence of a lot of things coming together. Yes. Um, yeah. People like to say that the gameplay is good, but that's just such a small portion of It's just one piece. It. I mean, it's about a third. There was another game I was working on. It was just a little game where you were sort of feeding things to these little creatures. Mm -hmm. It was a very simple game. You were just feeding things to these creatures. And you would prototype it, and the prototype would happen, and everybody's like, okay, it's fine. It looks like it's going to work. And then the art starts coming in, and then you actually see the cute little creature that you're feeding, and it was like, oh my god, this is amazing. I could do this all day. <laughs> Gameplay is exactly the same as it was before. But when all the elements start coming together, that's when it starts getting fun. There's no one thing that you can... You can't just point to the mechanics of the game and be like, that's what makes it fun. It's everything coming together at once that makes it really work. And that includes even the stuff that players won't necessarily notice, like... Difficulty tuning. Like difficulty tuning... Like the glass breaking into a million pieces as opposed to like four or five big chunks, right? right? It's all of those things come together. Making sure that particle effect is exactly right and hits at the exact right time is a big deal. So I have have an example of one time uh, when um, it was something really minor, minor sounding that made a huge difference. Is I was working on one game and uh, I was having a hard time making jumps, right? And I, so I went to the developer and I said, hey guys, uh, I'm having a hard time making jumps. I think that there's input lag, right? And an input lag, what that is, is like, let's say you push a button on the Xbox controller and then there is a minute fraction of a second before the game recognizes it and then lets you jump. Usually that happens if, uh, like, let's say you happen to hit the button right at the end of a frame and it takes a little while into that next frame to get it, right? But sometimes there will be multiple frame delays just because uh, the input's working its way through the system somewhere. And, uh, and nobody would believe me. So what I had to do was we got a camera set at 60 frames a second, focused it on the television. We got a little device where when you push the button on the Xbox controller, it lit up an LED, recorded it all. Then when I showed it to people, I slowed it down. <laughs> right? So what it would look like is my thumb would go brrr, click. Right? And a fraction of a second later, the light would come on, and then nothing, and then nothing, and then nothing, and then they jump, right? And we sent that to them, and they were like, oh, my God, there's an input. <laughs> so they fixed it, and it was maybe, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but I think it might have been something like three frames, right? So three sixtieths of a second, maybe. And uh, uh, they fixed it. They got rid of it, and the game was way more fun. Right. Every single person who played the game after that was like, what'd you do? It's so much more fun. And it was so small that nobody else who had played the game had even noticed it. And the only reason I looked at it was because I started sucking at the game. Right. So that's another example of a tiny feature that means a lot. It's things like just just how long it takes the button impulse to work its way through the system. Right, yeah. I mean, even then, like, there's a trick that you learn as you get along is you find those small things that people sort of react to and you start doing those first. Yeah, yeah. And then you get so much more leeway in terms of getting to test out your feature. But you get so much more pushback from people who don't think it's the most important thing to be doing. Absolutely. Right like, uh, there was one time I was working on a game and the multiplayer feature wasn't working out very well, right? The deadline was coming up. They had 30 days to make the multiplayer feature awesome, right? And I happened to go talk to the developer on the first day of that. Right? I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. When the round starts up, I want you to go round one, fight. Right? <laughs> then I want you to go player one, player two, and show pictures of them. Right? Then I want you to come into the game. Then when someone dies, I want you to go and slow the game down. Right? And then go loser, winner. <laughs> right? That's all I want you to do this month. Put everybody on that. They did it. 
goes back to the publisher and they're like, oh my God, it's amazing. What did you change? <laughs> and that was the only thing that had changed. They had not touched anything right. else. The game is exactly the same yes. game it was. Yes. And so the, the trick as you get further on into to game development is learning which of those things is the important one. Right. Which of the thousands. And of what it really comes down to, as mean as this is to say, it's about distracting the player. Sometimes, to not yeah. see the flaws yeah. that are there. And so much of the stuff that, that is fun is about hiding stuff that They're doesn't work. Fun. That's true. I, I, this, is, this is jumping a little ahead in our conversation, but maybe I'll give a little preview. Is If you can't make it fun, you then have to make it easy. Right. The other uh, way I've heard it phrased, if you can't make it fun, make it funny. So I guess let's just officially transition into the next topic of conversation, which is, if you can't make it fun, dot, dot, dot. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And Tony and I have heard this in various different ways. But Tony, Tony, you got yours from Gavin Dodd? I got mine from Gavin Dodd. That was one of the first things he taught me. Because we were talking about, uh, he was trying to do like, he was talking about, I think it was a Spyro setup, that he oh. just couldn't get to work. It just wasn't very fun. It wasn't, it. and he just sort of turned them all into chickens. And so you were just running around slaughtering chickens, and it was hilarious. And the gameplay was the same, but now you're laughing, because you're and you're distracted, chicken. and you get through it, and then you just move on. Well, and the reason the chicken thing was interesting and funny was because when you shot the chicken, there were a bunch of feathers that went up <laughs> Absolutely. in Absolutely. And then, and then it went, <laughs> like that. And you're, right? And the, the, it's those two little things that turned it from killing an enemy that only has one hit point into something that was hilarious. Right, it, absolutely. And then you just sort of, it distracts you that you, this is something you've done a million times before because yep, yep. it's now unique and kind of interesting and fun and you yeah. just move on and you have a little good memory of this thing that you just went through and then, because I mean, mm -hmm. the, the fact of the matter is there's so many things in games that you cannot cut. You have to find something to do with it. Yes. And at that point, you either make it easy or you make it funny yeah and those those will go a huge long way right uh, do you have an example of a time when you did that that's a well you know what is a pretty good example uh and maybe you're gonna disagree with this sure is sure. that uh the tira guys okay when i remember when the tira guys was first pitched it was pitched as space channel five right in ratchet and clank yes that was the that, that's how i pitched it originally right. yeah and we realized very quickly that that wasn't going to happen. Right. We were going to have all these tyrannoids like marching behind you. Yeah. Down. yeah. And we're like, okay, we're not doing that. Yes. But that, that was a pretty big part of the concept. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So the, the, it left a vacuum. And we had to basically figure out, okay, it's not going to be as full-fledged as we thought it was going to be, but it still needs to be compelling. Right. Because it's a major part of the game. We're not going to cut it. And so... We did the little things that were important. We had the little tyrannoid dancing around. Oh, 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 oh. We wrote the funny little dialogue that was right. in there. Yeah, yeah. It was enough to just get it through and have the player just sort of get through the get, get through the feature, have a good time. It wasn't what we originally envisioned, right. but it was enough for the player to be like, oh, that was cute and funny, and then just move along. Which actually is a nice segue into our last topic, which I have here as killing babies. Uh, I don't, that you, can't be right. Would you would you tell us why I'm killing against, babies? I'm against thing? killing babies. You're against maybe this maybe that's uh, like killing golden cows. Oh, you know, that like makes that makes babies. a little bit more like, sense. Is some a feature that you are really protective of, and you realize that it's just time that you take it out behind the woodshed. That I think that's the thing that people new to the game industry have the problem. Well, they think really that, understanding. They think that ideas matter. <laughs> they think, they oh, think, to be young. They think that an idea is worth money and is important. <laughs> that, 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 that something about the idea at all is valuable, which is wrong. I mean, there's, and then there's the other side of it where you might be sitting down with somebody and they're saying, we have to stop this. This is not going to work. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And, what you hear is your idea is bad. And you are bad because of it. When it might actually just mean, I agree with you. This can be good. It can't be good in time. Or even if it could be good in time, the things that you aren't working on to work on that, it's not worth right. the investment of money and cap, uh, you know, person capital. 
And you have to just sort of learn to you have to learn to pick your battles. Yeah. In terms of okay, I really want this to happen. I can make this happen, but it's not worth it. Right. Sometimes sometimes that's the right answer, and sometimes the right answer is to fight for it. But if you fight for everything, right. Right. So the the thing you quickly have to learn, well there's two things you quickly have to learn. One is that ideas are completely worthless. So whenever your idea is threatened, that's fine. Just come up with another one. Right. Right. Or use the other person's idea. Right. Right. Like if I have an idea, I'm sitting down with a programmer and I have an idea and the programmer doesn't want to do it, but wants to do something else that would accomplish all the exact same goals. My first instinct when I was new was to say, well, I'm the designer. Do it my way. (laughs) Right. And now I'm just like, yeah, do it that way because you'll be excited and it'll be better and I'll get all the credit for it. Wait, did I say sly. Too, did it's I, really did sly. I reveal too much on that one? It's really sly there, Mike. No, but I mean, I think it's it's one of those big things where, and it it always hurts and it always sucks because a lot of those times, those things that you're cutting, um, especially if it's your favorite thing that you spend a lot of time. Yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, there's something that you think is really important and really core to the game, and it, it happens with everything. Every everybody, ha- you're always going to lose a couple battles, and you're always going to uh, have some things that don't really work. I spent three months. Designing a uh, ELO-based ranking system slash matchmaking system for resistance, and uh, the right before it was implemented, they didn't implement it and just implemented halos with <laughs> with some extra stuff, and I had to be okay with that, right? Like that was that was what being a designer in that circumstance meant, right? I got a phone call from Ted, and Ted was like, "We're gonna change this, and you're gonna be okay with it." And I was like, well, yes, I am. <laughs> right? And that, that uh, you know, a younger me might not have been able to deal with that. Uh, I mean, at that point, I was still pretty young and I was still having ego trouble with, you know, when I was working on games. But that was one instance where it was just like, this is one case where I'm just going to have to let that go. <laughs> um, so do, do we have anything else that we want to... Oh, I wanted to tell a story about uh, uh, if you can't make it fun. Okay. All right. So uh, there was one game I was working on. Uh, it was one of the Skylanders games. I can't remember which one. Uh, where uh, it was probably the first one actually. Where you had um, we had these barriers in the level that would block you from going through the level unless you had a guy with the correct element, right? And the purpose behind this was to get people to switch out their toys, right? Uh, the the gates were only for the elements that came in the starter pack, so we knew that you had them, right? It, was, it wasn't to get you to buy anything. It was just, we want you to be churning through toys and all this stuff. And uh, when we put it in, everybody hated it. They're like, but I'm playing with this guy now. Why am I switching? And then we couldn't just go to him and be like, because gameplay, <laughs> right? We had, to, we had to say, well, okay, you're, you're playing with your toy right now the way you want to. We need to suck it up, right? So what we did was we, we took that feature and said, we're going to make it optional in a whole bunch of different places. If you're a specific element, you can break this thing. And sometimes we're going to break that rule because, you know, this guy seems like you should be able to break it, right? And people loved that. They loved that they could switch into this character and optionally do something awesome with him. So what we did was we, we took this feature, we drastically made it easier Right, we scaled it down. We gave it more personality, which is, I think, what you're getting at with if you can't make it fun, make it mm-hmm. funny. And then we just put it places, and all of a sudden, it took a feature which was really draining and sucking the life out of the game, and turned it into something that really helps the game's flavor, and and was actually a much better execution of our goal of getting people to switch toys. So I'm gonna so. Now that we've talked about all these different concepts, yes, you're gonna bring them together. I want to switch. I think I, I think I can. I okay. think we can do it. All right, I and this, see I'm gonna switch. It, but this is gonna be about you. Okay. I'm gonna be asking you questions. And we're gonna to try to bring this together. All right. So for our final segment, we're going to have Tony interview me. That's right. This okay. This we're is, gonna. This, this is gonna tie it all together. This is like the hot so, seat. So this, so we weren't all rambling. Now we're gonna give specific examples of how it all works. Maybe this will be a, a, a regular feature. One of we'll us find gets the out. hot seat at the end. Yeah, that might work. Yeah. We're testing it out right now. Yeah, let's see how it goes. It'd be nice if we had some theme music right now. Not that's not for this podcast, but some theme music in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the hot seat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, something like that. You know. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. So it's a seat, but it's hot. 
this is something you have a lot more experience about than I than I do, which okay. is why I'm posing this to you. All right. When you run focus tests with people, yes, you have to translate all their feedback into getting at the actual problems. Yes, yeah. Like you like you will put the game in front of a focus tester, and then they will say, "I don't like this because of this." And in your mind, you have to say, "No, you actually don't like this because of this." <laughs> right. And you have yeah. to take that feedback back. Right. Like, how do you how do you process that? How do you really kn- put put the how do you identify where the real problem lies when you're sitting there and the person's right there in front of you telling you this isn't fun? And how do you turn that into meaningful feedback in terms of okay, how do we make this fun? Well, it's di- it's different with each instance, obviously, but I can give you a few sort of broad categories. Uh, with some of them, they say keywords, and I know from experience, from hearing it a bunch of times, that that keyword means this is wrong, right? So, like for example, if someone says the game is shallow, right, that sorts it down to a few problems that it could be. For example, uh, it means that they're doing the same thing too often, right, and it's not getting harder satisfactorily. A good example of this would be the. Uh, tractor beam puzzles in Ratchet and Clank 2, right? Uh, it was all about basically taking a key and putting it in a door. All of my mechanics were about that. And people were saying, this feels shallow. And what I had to find out eventually was that it meant that they wanted different things besides just taking a key to a door. I actually had to invent mechanics that were about something new, right? If you hear, you know, ah, uh, it's just kind of boring, right? Eh, if, it, if you get a lot of that, it's usually because it's not in your words, funny enough. It doesn't have enough theatrics associated with it. So you can, often when someone just is sort of meh about something, you can sprinkle some effects fairy dust and audio fairy dust on it, and that'll fix the problem. We used to do that with Clank, right? Whenever we'd have problems, we'd put in another robot that did something cute, right? And then that that would fix the problem of it feeling just sort of like, oh, it's okay, but they're not saluting at me, right? right? And then the, the, the third one is... Uh, they're having the problem because they don't understand what the game's asking them to do. And that's the easiest one to tell. Because uh, they're, the way that they tell you about it indicates that they're clearly misunderstanding the problem. And the fact that you watch them do it for three hours <laughs> and watch, just watch them fail repeatedly, you're like, oh yeah, they failed because of this. Often, a lot of times when that's the problem, it's trying to figure out how to get them to understand what the game's asking them to do without just fucking telling them. Right? Because players hate it when you tell them. Like, uh, I get a lot of people saying, tutorials and games are bad because I don't like when the game tells me what to do. And I'm like, the tutorial is being done wrong because you know it's there. The fact that it's in there just telling you what to do meant either the developer ran out of time and just had to tell you what to do to finish the game or that they implemented it poorly. Right? That's all it means. It doesn't mean that tutorials are bad. Every game has a tutorial. Yeah. I mean, like, if, if you play uh, some old games, like SNES games, the tutorials are so well hidden that you will never find them, right? There's not one line of help text. It's just the way they designed the game means that you have to learn something. I have a quick aside story. Sure, sure. Um, we, we've been playing King of Thieves lately on our right. iOS devices. Right. Amazing game. Uh, I was over at a friend's house the other weekend, and I was showing them the game, and uh, their four-year-old daughter wanted to play. Uh, she played my game for a little while, and I was like, you know, well, you can just download this on your own thing, and you can have the game for yourself. And she's like, oh, it's amazing. Just lock out the credit card. <laughs> so they downloaded it for her, and then she was playing. Can't read. She can't read. Uh-huh. But they did their tutorial so well that she flew through and knew exactly what to do for that game. That is how it should be. It should be that way. Good enough for a four-year-old. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Well, there's an there's an excellent article on uh, Gama Sutra called "The Invisible Hand of Super Metroid," and it talks about how the entire first two levels are a tutorial, and it's just so slick that nobody ever noticed it, and that you know when you watch people play, they just do these things because, like for example, they had to teach you sometimes you don't run right, right? Because two D games mostly go to the right. So what they did was, first screen of the game, they put a wall on the right. So you got to run to the left. Tutorial. You can run left. Right? <laughs> like, done poorly, it would have been, hey, Samus, you can run left if you want to. <laughs> like, everybody's seen that. But, right. You know, they just had enough 
time to get that right. And, you know, they were fucking masters. Right. So. And do you have any stories of being in a focus test where you're just like, oh, no, this is all wrong. There is no salvaging. The game? Salvaging. No, the, a, a particular feature, a particular something that's happening where you're just like watching on in horror as it all goes wrong. It's only horror if it's my feature. <laughs> right? If it's someone else's feature, it's it's still really difficult. Like it hurts you to watch them failing at it and know that it's going to but you can you have the perspective to be like the game will be better without this, right? But when it's your feature and you're watching someone suffer because of something that you tried to make fun, yes. Yes, it's really awful. I've had lots of experiences like that where uh I just had to be like, all right, I was wrong. Let's just stop. So that was fine. We only really care about player frustration on the critical path. Right. If, if it's optional, fuck them. <laughs> right? Solid attitude. That, well, that, that's always... When I go talk to somebody, uh, a, a, like a new designer, and I have to tell them to make something easier, and they start looking like they're going to cry, I say, here's the secret, buddy. Just make a whole bunch of optional ones. You can make them as hard as you want. <laughs> you can be. You can make your heart's desire of fucking bullshit puzzles. Just go to town on that shit. I think it's a common thing. I mean, it certainly was for me in terms of... I had a very adversarial relationship with the player when I was starting out. With the player? With the general? player. Okay. With the player Not in with general. a specific player. Right. Okay. Well, some specific players, but in general, the player. You wanted to kill the player. That's that's, that's what right. You that was my was goal. Fun. That yeah. was that was what I thought my job was. Hence the yeti. <laughs> Hence the yeti. The snow beast. I mean, I thought that was I thought that was my job as a game developer to make something challenging and difficult for the player to overcome. Right, and challenging and difficult end up not being the same thing. Right. It, yeah. I mean, it's even that. Not everything can be challenging to overcome yes yes you have to pick true. your spots you can't just make a game that's 100 percent challenging to get. well you can but that's a very specific type of game those are those tend to be very niche games well what the generally what uh what the really good games do they, that are hard right that have reputations for being hard is they have a very very skillfully done ramp it's just hard enough just long enough to get you into it so that you're willing to expend the energy on something hard. Uh, the game FTL, have you ever played that one? Yes. Uh, that's one of those, right? Because that game, you can go a long way before you realize you're totally hosed, right? But there's enough small victories in there that when you get hosed, you're just like, I'll play again, right? Like it doesn't become a throw this game in the trash moment. Right. Right. They have a very skillfully executed difficulty curve. It's not just them saying, from round one, we're going to murder the fuck out of the player. <laughs> right? Because... But that was my... That was That, that was, was my view. attitude yeah. at the beginning. Was balls to the wall, always try to kill the right. players. Right. Always go 100%, go hard or go home. But as it turns out, it's pretty easy to kill players. It's really easy to yeah. kill players. It's not hard. Yeah. It's, That's not... It doesn't even require any... You just have to cheat. Talent. Yeah. And as a developer, cheating. you can cheat like crazy. Yeah, you can you can change the rules of the physical <laughs> universe. There is no nothing stopping you from fucking with people. And actually, that could be a good uh, topic for our next podcast: is cheating, cheating for the player's best interest. That sounds like a good. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah. So with that, I guess why don't we just leave that as a cliffhanger? Or did you have a point? You're, no, I think that's. I, I was just adding on to what you were saying about uh, you know making something hard and trying to pull people away from the idea that hard content is good content yeah yeah hard content can be good content but easy content hard... is not necessarily bad content right that and i think hard that's, content is not necessarily good i think that's really the hard thing that people it just because it's easy doesn't mean it's bad which is again uh what you were saying if you can't make it fun make it easy sometimes making it easy is absolutely the, the answer right you need to, yeah. to make it better exactly so for the useless podcast I'm Mike Stout. I'm Tony Garcia. And we'll catch you next time. Absolutely. Yeah. On the Useless Podcast. That's right. On the Useless Podcast. You said it! Yeah! <laughs>